The holidays are upon us, so it's time for me to tackle two things I haven't yet for basics, Yorkshire pudding and a classic beef roast. We'll complete today's holiday dinner with a special batch recipe for a holiday martini featuring today's sponsor, the Botanist Isla Dry Gin. A batch Botanist martini is the perfect drink to bring along to a party, and it's surprisingly easy to mix up and freeze ahead. Let's get down to basics. So we're going to start with an inexpensive but still delicious roast, the eye round. Now this is a very inexpensive cut of beef, but that's because it almost completely lacks intramuscular fat or marbling, and it's a little tough, so we're going to start with a best practice for virtually any roast, dry brining or liberally coating with kosher salt and refrigerating uncovered for 24 to 48 hours. This not only deeply flavors and tenderizes the meat, it helps it retain moisture throughout the process of cooking. How does that happen? Uh, well, how do you think it happens? I just want to make sure you know. I have no idea. Would a guy with hands this fast lie to you? Now the other thing we want to take care of ahead of time if possible is preparing the Yorkshire pudding batter. First we're beating together three large eggs with one cup of whole milk, or if you're tuning in from across the pond, about 236.588 milliliters. Go ahead and tiny whisk it. Oh, that's what I get for making fun of the metric system. Wipe yourself off and tiny whisk until good and homogenous. Then, in a separate, preferably spouted container, we're combining 100 grams of all-purpose flour. Tiny whisking until homogenous, or this is dumb, let's move this to a bowl, where we're going to constantly whisk the dry ingredients as we slowly pour in the wet. Once mostly combined, but not lumpless, we're gonna put that back into the spouted container, cover, and fridge overnight. Now this apparently helps the Yorkshire puddings rise through a process called lateral osmosis, which I just made up, but it does help the Yorkshire puddings rise. Now if your roast has a fat cap, you're gonna to wanna to score it. This not only looks nice, but it helps the fat to render out and effectively base the meat as it's cooking. See, sometimes I know why things happen. Like that the next thing you might want to consider is tying your roast, especially if it's very uneven like this one. This can even out the size of the roast and help it cook, well, more evenly. You can either just tie it off every inch or so with a square knot, or you could truss it, even if you're not terribly good at trussing and you're on camera, and it doesn't really change the shape of your roast at all, you're gonna stick to your guns, not fix the ties, and get a little pissy with yourself in the voiceover. Next up, we're gonna insert a temperature probe into the thickest part of the roast and drizzle it with oil, something neutral like vegetable or canola, which is gonna help the roast develop a crust. Then to cook the roast as gently as possible, we're using a technique from the New York Times. Putting the roast into a preheated 500 degree Fahrenheit oven for 15 minutes, then turning off the oven and letting the roast finish cooking with residual heat. Now, once the roast comes out of the oven, that's when you want to make your Yorkshire puddings. We'll go over the technique more later, but these guys bake at 400 degrees Fahrenheit for about 20 minutes, so perfect amount of time for while the roast is resting. Basically, we're pouring the batter into a preheated muffin tin that has a tablespoon of the fat of your choice in each muffin uh, cavity. They should emerge from the oven a bunch of playful, misshapen cups, perfect for tearing and soaking up gravy. Keep these warm in a basket covered with a clean dish towel. The other thing we want to take care of whilst our roast rests is build our gravy. Now we should have some nice pan drippings from the roast. Go ahead and pour those off and let it sit for five minutes so all the fat settles on the top. Then we're going to use this fat to make a roux. If you're dealing with some very lean beef and you didn't get any drippings, just use butter or the fat of your choice. Heat up two to three tablespoons in a medium saucepan, add two to three tablespoons of flour, whisk constantly over medium heat into a smooth paste, and cook for like two to three minutes until the raw flour smell dissipates. Then one small ladle full at a time, we're going to start slowly drizzling in some hot beef stock, whisking constantly to prevent lumps. We're not trying to make a thick Thanksgiving style gravy here, so ultimately adding about four to six cups of liquid. And just for good measure, let's make sure we get all that good stuff off the bottom of our roasting pan. Adding a couple ladlefuls of hot stock and using a whisk to scrape up all the good stuff, and then adding it to the gravy party. Your resultant gravy shouldn't be too thick, but hopefully have some nice body to it, so it's more reminiscent of the jus that Yorkshire pudding is often served with. And now it's finally time to carve and serve. Cut off these stupid strings that didn't do anything. Now, I overcooked this guy by about five degrees so it's not going to be as rosy as I would like it to be, but it's still a pretty solid medium. You want to pull it from the oven about 10 degrees shy of where you want it to end up. And there you have it, a Yorkshire pudding and roast that's as tasty as it is thrifty. It's thrifty, 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 No. But let's say you really want to blow the bloody doors off. For that, we're going to need a big old bone 
bone-in rib roast. Preferably prime, which means that it's got lots of fat and excellent marbling, and preferably bone-in so we can harvest the bones. These make an attractive rack upon which to roast your roast, but they're also packed with flavor. More on what to do with these boys in a bit, but for now we need to prep our roast. We're going to start by doing the exact same thing, dry brining it. This time I'm covering it with a mixture of salt and freshly ground black pepper. Some folks swear against this because they say the pepper burns, but it's never tasted burnt to me, and I always forget to finish seasoning my steak with freshly ground black pepper right before eating, so that's what we're going to do. Fridge this guy uncovered on a rack set in a rim baking sheet overnight in the fridge. Now back to those bones. Restaurants have the advantage of roasting multiple huge joints of beef every day and harvesting all their delicious drippings, or they have a lot of byproducts and bones that they can turn into stock and then demi-glass. So this is how I make my best at-home approximation. I'm roasting those ribs and some oxtails or any other inexpensive cut of beef that's got lots of bones and fat and meat and connective tissue. I'm tossing them in oil and roasting them in a preheated 400 degree Fahrenheit oven with some roughly chopped carrots, celery, onions, and garlic. Once deeply browned, I'm putting them in a big old stock pot along with a bunch more aromatics. Let's add some more fresh carrots, some more onions, some more celery, and I really love to add parsnips to my stock. They're a little earthy, but they also have a distinct sweetness, plus some fresh herbs like thyme and parsley, some whole peppercorns, some bay leaves, all the stock making greatest hits. Now for the tricky part. This guy needs to barely simmer for at least 12 hours, up to 48. This is going to maximize not only the flavor, but the gelatin and collagen that we extract from the meat and bones. Once that's done, we're going to do our best to defat it. Make sure you hang on to this fat. Instead of going into our gravy, this is going to be going into our Yorkshire puddings. Now for the gravy, this time there's no roux. This stock is so rich with flavor, all we need to do is reduce it. So I'm grabbing about four cups worth, placing it in a nice wide saute pan and boiling it aggressively until it's reduced to about a cup. Now back to the roast. Just like last time, we're going to rub it down with fat, but now we have all that delicious beef tallow we've harvested from our stock. So go ahead and thoroughly coat all facets, and then we're going to make a bed of vegetables. Now I want to serve these vegetables with the roast, so I'm going to try to make them attractive. I got some parsnips, some multicolored carrots, some onions. You could also use turnips, shallots, celeriac, any of your favorite winter root vegetables. Toss them a little bit of oil, salt, and pepper, and dump them into a large roasting pan. We don't want them to be too far apart so they don't burn, but also not too crowded so they don't brown. Place the roast set in a roasting rack over top, insert a temperature probe into the thickest part of the roast, drop it into a preheated 450 degree Fahrenheit oven for about 25 minutes, then reduce the heat to 325 and continue roasting for one to two hours until the thickest part of the roast hits 120 to 130. Set aside our lovely roasted vegetables and keep them warm until serving. Set aside all those delicious pan drippings and make sure you use a little hot stock to get all that good stuff off the bottom of the roasting pan. Add that to your jus and there you go, extra flavor. Now back to our Yorkshire pudding. This time we're going to use either our pan drippings or the tallow that we got off the top of the stock. Pour about a tablespoon into each muffin hole, put it in a preheated 400 degree Fahrenheit oven for 5 to 10 minutes until the fat is nice and hot, and then we pour in our Yorkshire pudding batter about halfway up each little cup. That's a better word for it. Once the puds are out of the oven, all there is left to do is carve and serve. Rosy, fatty roast beef, light, ethereal Yorkshire puddings, lovely caramelized root vegetables, and just about the most flavorful beef jus in the known universe. It's the perfect big special occasion meal. And I adapted the Yorkshire pudding recipe from Mary Berry, so I think it's illegal for you to say that I did it wrong. Really, all this celebratory roast needs is a great cocktail, and the botanist Batch Holiday Martini immediately comes to mind. To make our eight-serving batch cocktail, I'm going to start by thoroughly muddling a dozen cranberries in a large, very scientific pitcher until completely smashed and getting juicy. Then we're going to very observantly pour in 15 ounces of the botanist Isla Dry Gin, add a couple of sprigs of fresh rosemary, give it a spirited stir, and allow to infuse for six to eight hours at room temperature. Then we're going to finish building the cocktail in the pitcher, adding six ounces of water and three ounces of dry vermouth. Strain into the serving vessel of your choosing and keep in the freezer for two hours before serving. Serving. Present as a charming holiday gift for a friend, garnish with skewered cranberries and a sprig of fresh rosemary. Thanks again to the botanist Isla Dry Gin for sponsoring this episode, and thanks to Sawyer for enjoying this cocktail with me. An excellent martini is my go-to holiday drink, and for a great-tasting martini, you really need a great-tasting gin. That's where the botanist comes in. It tastes great in everything from a Negroni to a gin and tonic, but particularly in a spirit-forward cocktail like the martini, where its flavor really shines. Pick up a bottle of the botanist to have it on your bar for the holiday season. You can order a bottle on Drizzly. The link is in the video description. And please remember to enjoy the botanist responsibly.